Good evening. I'd like to call to order the um, RSU 14 Wyndham Raymond School District Board of Directors meeting. It is 6.30 on October 17, 2018. Mr. Prince? Kay Prince. Present. Eric Colby? Jenny Cummins? Here. Don Dillon? Marge Gaboni? Here. Kate Hensler? Here. Anna Kenny? Here. Kate Lavey? Here. And Scott McLean. We all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, are there any adjustments to the agenda? I don't think so. So, if there is any, if there are any um, public input at this time, seeing none, I would like a motion to go into executive session, please. I move to approve going into executive session to consider the possible expulsion of a student pursuant to one MRSA subsection four o five six B. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? All those opposed? We are in executive session. Okay, we are back um, from executive session and we are needing to vote um, that the board determines the following. That's a, board, a, a vote about expulsion that the student's actions were deliberately disobedient, that the removal of the student is necessary for the peace and usefulness of the school, that based on these facts, the board hereby expels the student effective immediately for an indefi indefinite period of time, and that the superintendent notifies the student and his or her parent for this action in writing with a copy of these written findings of fact and conclusions. If the student is expelled for an indefinite period of time, a reentry plan is will be prepared by the superintendent in, cons in consultation with the student and his or her family. The student's parents and the student have a right to request readmission pursuant to law. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of expulsion? All those opposed? Thank you. Okay. We are now going to have a meeting. We have Mr. Hansen come and talk to us about um, how you can run. <laughs> how people can run about the um, Jordan Small Middle School and Raymond Elementary School facilities. Well, we we can do that, but we can also say that um, we just had a site walk at Raymond Elementary School at the playground, and that um, was really fabulous what the things that they're doing there are just amazing. Hi. Hello. So we're very excited about that. Um, I guess we're going to have to take a minute um, if no one has anything to say about that. But we're waiting for Mr. Hansen to come in. So Kevin, we're taking a minute. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, we're back. And uh, now I'd like to ask uh, Bill Hansen, the Director of Facilities, to talk to us about Jordan Small Middle School and Raymond Elementary School. Great, good evening, I'm Bill Hansen, RSU 14 Facilities Director. Um, just kind of a quick recap of where we've been in the last two years. There's been a lot going on up here in Raymond. Um, happy to say that we're kind of closing in on the end of some pretty big projects um, that have, are going to make a significant long-lasting improvement on the buildings. Um, kind of the first one I'll talk about is the RES roof replacement that was completed last year. Um, it was a little bit of a surprise. We had a, a roof a membrane that we found failing, and I appreciate the board's support to get that changed out relatively quickly. That was all changed out last year, so we've got a brand new EPDM roof on that that has a I believe it's a 25-year warranty, so we're, we're good to go for quite a while mm -hmm. with that. So um, that was great. And um, I want to thank my staff because I started to notice some things in the building that weren't quite right. We got on top of it, and we saw that we were, we were experiencing a 
failure that we found later on that Stevens TPO roof was actually an issue they had as part of that roof membrane being a new TPO tend to feel that way. So uh, the good news is, is it's all new and we're no longer having a, uh, a, a roof that uh, allows water in the building. So that's great. Um, the other big project that we recently completed was the roof replacement Jordan Small. Um, I don't know how many you know about the type of roof that was. That was an inverted roof. And if you're familiar with inverted roof, I'll, if you're not, I'll tell you about it. You basically take, think about this picture. You take your membrane and you put it in the bottom of a bowl. That's your roof membrane. Then you put insulation on top of that. Then you put a divorce board material on top of that. Then a fabric and then stone. And then you add water and cold weather and ice. So if you think about that, then trying to find that leak, you have to take off the stone, the fabric, the insulation, the divorce board, and then try to find where that leak is on a, on a roof that's not flat. Really challenging. So our new roof here is a fully adhered EPDM roof. So we have the deck, we have the insulation, mechanically fastened insulation to the deck, and we've got fully adhered EPDM rubber roof on the top that you can walk and inspect all the seams. Okay, more traditional. And it, it kind of brings this roof in line with all the other roofs we have in the district. Um, majority of our roofs in the district are EPDM, 60 mil thickness, which is pretty thick. Uh, we have a few metal roofs, primary school being one of them. We have a limited metal roof over at RES in some places. And we have the barrel roof at the high school. And finally, in our middle school in Wyndham, we get the luxury of having shingled roof there. So that's uh, probably... Uh, in the classroom wing, so that's that's probably a least desirable roof in our least desirable building. Um, so that's that as far as that goes. Um, you may have noticed if you drove by Jordan Small Gym that it's no longer paint, it's no longer peeling, and it's two different colors. It's now one. It's all white, which I'm pretty excited about that. And I don't know how you may have noticed that the clocks actually work now. Oh wow! <laughs> so one of the things that was driving me crazy is direct facilities to drive by and see the clocks yeah. wrong because I'm thinking to myself. This guy can't even fix clocks. I'll get take care of the building. So yeah. they all actually work now, which makes me very happy about that. So if you notice that, um, probably next year I'll get the lights working on so you can see them at night. So that, <laughs> that's kind of a goal. Okay. Um, so and finally, um, over a course of three or four years, we did a kind of a long restoration of the masonry in the buildings. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it really was quite um, challenging in that the windows themselves, the sills were flat. So if I, if I can give you a picture of that, a flat sill, over time, we'll tend to warp up, and guess where the water's going? Into the building. So what we did, actually, is all those sills were all ground down so that the flashing is at an angle, so the water wants to naturally kind of drain out from the window. So that was completed. So pretty excited about that. So it's, it's been a busy time here um, at the schools. And I'll we go across the street to RES, another big project that we're well on the way on is the, the expansion of the playground. Um, so there's been a... So it's been now about a three or four year effort to get this work going. It started about four years ago with the board approving us going ahead with the permitting, which took about a year. And then we had a great, great uh, event with the, the military, which was wonderful, which was last year. And then um, we completed the fill install the end of, end of last year. And then this year we actually were able to get the play field created and the water quality filters constructed, so now we actually have grass growing. So again, our goal there is to open this, that field up in the fall of 2019. Um, but we'll have it open this winter again for, for sliding. And last year, I don't know if you saw the actual um, video that Gary put on the web. The kids were having a ball sliding down the hill onto the field. So I'm sure they're looking forward to that again. It's, it's, it's really turned out nicely. Uh, I think it's going to be a great asset for us um, long term. So. I don't know if you have any questions about those projects, and I can talk to you about what's kind of the go forward, what we'll be looking at um, in the future for things that are coming down the pike. Any, any questions? Okay, so um, Don's not here. It seems it's still, I really enjoy working with Chris. It seems strange here. You know, this isn't meant to be Don's gloom and doom, as he likes to talk <laughs> about, you know, and I guess I'll keep that <laughs> phrase as long as I work because I'll remember that. But, you know, with any facility like this, there's work that has to be done, and it, it's an ongoing maintenance thing. So I'm going to list some projects for you just to kind of give you an idea when you hear this. Um, one of the things that um, we start doing the budget season right now is always sitting down with Chris, and we'll put together our 10-year capital plan, and we tweak it. It always changes. And I could develop the plan today. Chris and I could say, that's a good plan. We could present it to you, and tomorrow something could change. But say, guess what? It's going to shuffle around. Mm -hmm. okay? The good news is, is that as a board, you've been committed to 
allocating funding to maintain that plan. And I'll give you a quick example for you to think about. Um, you do a great job with the buses. We buy three buses every year. You know kind of that's the plan, two to three. So you don't say, I'm not going to buy, for three years I won't buy a bus, and I'm going to buy ten, because guess what? In ten years, you get ten buses have to be replaced. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same thing with capital. If we spend the money necessary each year to keep things on an even keel, you avoid those years that you're going to be in really in dire straits. It makes your cash flow easier. And then if we have a lease payment, one of the things we, we work on is we look at our capital, and we try to keep about half of our capital in lease payments and half in cash payments. And the reason we try to do that is it gives some flexibility to move. If they were all in lease payments, I really would be stuck, right? Because I can't, I can't make that movement. So that's kind of the target we shoot for. So the good news is, is the board has been great about maintaining our capital spending um, for these products so that we can continue to work on the plan. So I feel very fortunate. I want to thank you for that because it really does help. So um, focusing up here, um, it's time for us to do some maintenance on our stormwater ponds. We have two of them here, um, one behind Jordan Small, one behind RES. I'm working on pricing for that. So what happens over time, they fill in with debris and dirt and what have you there. That's their job, actually, is to collect those things so it doesn't run off into the world. Well, um, it's been quite a while since they've been maintained. So it's time. I'm actually going to do a survey with Strowing Stormwater, who does our stormwater inspections. And then I will also get pricing together on the capital plan, and we'll look into what makes sense to when to do that. Whether it's one this year, come this next year, and one the year after that, or two together, we'll figure that out. But that's that's due to be to be done. So that will change the appearances of the ponds because there'll be some dredging and cleaning out. So just there'll be some people who will be concerned about that. It's one of the things we have to do by by the DEP to maintain those those features. Okay, and they are both man-made, so we just need to maintain them. Um, we are looking at a boiler replacement here at Jordan Small. That's that's on the dock. It's actually in the capital plan right now. Um, so we're going to be looking at that. We do have a problem that, as you're aware of, we've had a failed boiler at the, at the high school. So we're trying to look at all our options with that. I'll be back to the boiler with my recommendations as to what our path forward will be. But the boiler at Jordan Small is operational and running. It's not having any issues, but it also was brand new in 87. So from a life, a life expectancy, it's really at the point to look at replacing it. Um, and it will be my recommendation to the board. What we do is we put in two boilers as opposed to one. Because it, that's kind of the standard we have in our schools, that you put in two smaller boilers, you get higher efficiency when you're not running your high loads, and you have some redundancy. Should one go down and not work, you've got one that can carry part of your load. Um, kind of important if you're talking about a school that has to stay up and running and, and serve kids. Because so far, I don't think we've missed a day with, a, with kids because of no heat. We came close with the high school recently, but yeah. made it by. Um, so that, that is, is kind of the goal. It's kind of the standard we have in, in all our schools is to have multiple plants. Um, RES, okay, brand new school in 2000, right? It's now 2018. We're going to start a plan on rest masonry restoration. And what that's going to involve is really cleaning and waterproofing the brick. Um, if you don't do that, you, all those brick shelves that are so beautiful hold water. Water gets into the, into the masonry joints, and then pretty soon you're talking about a large restoration cost now to go in and to repoint all that, that brick. And when you repoint it, you're going to say, oh, Bill, it doesn't look good because that mortar doesn't match the rest of it because right. it won't. There isn't a mason alive that can do it, other than taking it all out and replacing it, which now we're talking about just a huge cost. But so by just by cleaning and, and waterproofing it, you can really extend that life. But you're talking about it's it's a big building. That's a lot of square foot there. It's not going to be cheap. Now, when we come to the budget process, update the capital plan. I'll have hard numbers in that, or, hard, or, or number ranges for you to review. And as always, all this capital stuff, it's always the board that approves the plan. How we move forward, I just don't go spending. It's something we have to do um, for your approval. Um, we do have uh, plans to move the RES office to the front of the building and change that entryway so it's, it provides a secure vestibule and allows parents to come into the building without actually into the office or into the building. That's, that's on the docket. Um, there's money in a capital reserve fund for that. Um, Jordan Small, we have pneumatic controls still. Erica, I know you're looking at me like I'm crazy, but yes, we still have pneumatic controls there. That, that's going to be something that we're going to be working towards, towards removing. We did. This this past uh, year, we replaced pneumatic controls in the gym and the cafeteria in Jordan Small. So this is now all, all DDC, which stands for direct digital control, which means it's electronic and much, much more precise. But we still have a significant amount of pneumatic controls in, in Jordan Small we need to replace. Both fire alarms and RES in Jordan Small are conventional. And the, my recommendation will be we move to, to an addressable so we know where the problems are. 
Um, that's a requirement in Wyndham to do that, and that's the standard we're moving towards in all our schools. And it gives you a precise pinpoint of where the issue is, and it was, it's, a, it's a move that's supported by Chief Tupper that we move to that direction. So rather than you have an alarm, you have an alarm in room 23. Mm -hmm. It really helps the responders know right where to go. Um, um, next thing coming up is around paving and stormwater around Jordan Small. If you drive around the Jordan Small parking lot, you'll see we've got severe alligator cracking of the pavement. It's failing. Um, but with that, with that repaving, if we don't do um, some improvements on stormwater collection and, and drainage, <coughs> pavement doesn't like water. So you really need to do that part of the piece of the puzzle. That's again, that's going to be on the plan. Um, and again, this isn't now necessarily next year. I'm just trying to give you the forecast looking outward so you kind of have an idea of what we're looking at. Um, we are going to be looking at um, upgrading the network UPS and cooling right now. If you're familiar, the network um, hub really for the whole um, Raymond is in the library closet. And right now we have a fan that pulls air out of that space, but it doesn't have cooling and doesn't have um, really uh, commercial quality UPS and those are the two things that we would be doing. Again, those are the things, the moves we're making where we have our phone systems and network stuff is to put in systems like that so that we have a, a system that will continue to run and work. Um, finally, um, I'm going to be talking to the facilities committee about creating um, cool spaces within our schools. Um, we're really starting to struggle with challenges, particularly this past, this past summer, mm -hmm. the, the early spring and this past fall. I've had building temperatures that were very high, um, particularly second floor of RES. Um, and kind of the goal would be to create a space such as, like in, in here in Jordan Small, the library is not air conditioned, so we could air condition that one space. Classes could rotate through that to get some cooling time. Um, I need to look at a strategy for, for RES because in the second floor, really it gets hit hard. We've tried to manage it as best we could with portable air conditioners, floor mounts. They, all they do is take the edge off. They don't really make it really tolerable. And as the temperature continues to be higher, it's really become a challenge. And as you know, we have cooling in, in other schools. I mean, looking at it kind of as a, as a facilities committee at all our spaces so we can get some equity in the different locations to provide some spaces for relief when we get those 90 degree days. We did have, I think one day we had to send kids home because we just couldn't maintain temperature. Mm -hmm. And we are doing things like running, you know, running the air handles at nighttime to bring the cool air and stuff, but when it doesn't cool down, it in the evening, I just there's not much room we can we can do to move with that. Um, we had dual plans to rough plans to look at a relocation of Jordan's small middle school office to bring it to the front too. It'd be the last building we haven't done that with. And then finally, um, it's probably time to take a look at the bleaches at Jordan Small Wing because of the age that they are. Um, so that's kind of kind of a quick review of kind of where we are. I, I'm, I'm really pleased we've got a lot accomplished. <coughs> we really have got a lot accomplished in the in the last few years, and I appreciate the board's support of the capital, the work we have put in here. Uh, I think it's really made a difference. Um, and you know, if you look at the the total asset value of our uh, of where we're at, you know, whether you want to look at it at a roughly you know 150 to 200 million dollars in in assets, you know, if you had a 50 year life, that you're talking about two percent. You know, we're talking you know in the range of three to four million dollars a year of capital reinvestment just to maintain what you have. That's not building new capabilities. And we are building new capabilities in the work that we're doing now. Um, it's, uh, again, I, I've had a lot, of, a lot of great help from, this, from the staff and understanding from the teaching staff as we kind of juggle these projects because they never quite go on schedule or time. And often, you know, we have to work on other challenges. So it's, it's I think it's been very successful in the, in the last two years. And I want to, again, thank the board for your support in getting this work done. Happy to entertain any questions that you might have. I heard from a mutual friend that uh, said he could make your life easy on the energy contracting side, but uh, <laughs> I told him to save it for, for you. I'm sure you know what I'm talking yes, about. Yes, I do. <laughs> I like the idea that you are um, looking at cooling spaces. I know uh, that is a huge um, deal um, for the teaching staff and as well as the, the kids. Um, and not all the schools in this district um, are air conditioned. There's Wyndham High School is. Um, parts of uh, the primary school are. Correct. Um, Manchester School is not. It's not, no. Um, and then Wyndham Middle School? Is not. Is not. No. So, we 
we really should be looking at that. Um, I mean, I don't know how, other than what you're doing, but one, one having a cooling space. Yeah. But so what I'd hope to do is work with the facilities committee, and maybe we form a group that works with building staff, or maybe maybe some teachers, and talk about how can we make it. A, which spaces do we choose to, to work? Like if you think at the, the middle school, you know, the cafeteria was something that we went after that was that was air conditioned. It's a big space that could serve multiple classrooms. Right. You know, libraries are one place I like to, to air condition. And primary school was not, and I feel it should be, because of all the books we have there. Mm -hmm. You know, humidity control is kind of a big mm -hmm. thing. You talk about cellulose, because that's cellulose, humidity, and darkness. Sure. Then you have food, you have moisture, you have mold. Yeah. Um, so good place to try to, try to avoid that. So. I think I think it's it's the weather continues to get warmer. Something we need to look at, and there's some real challenges up here in Raymond that we don't have three-phase power, so we're somewhat limited as to what we can bring in for for resources in here. Uh, the three-phase power is down the road a ways. I've been told it's a quite a bit of money to bring it this far up to you know extend it beyond. So we do have capability limitations by just the amount of energy that's available on the electric side of the world. But um, with all the efficiencies improvements that are coming with equipment. You know, I think it's worth worth looking at again. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then just taking the edge off, dropping the humidity and the temperature a little bit is huge. Sure. It doesn't have to be, you know, 70 degrees and 50 percent. If you can get it to be 77 and and, and 50 percent versus 85 and right. 90, it's it's yeah. it's tolerable for for the kids to be in. So, we'll be looking at all those things. And again, it would all come back to you know, board's recommendation based on priorities too. Now. This, these list, this list is not any priority list. When we get to the point in that, we'll, we'll work on priorities that comes from the facilities committee, kind of developing, bringing it up to the, to the board in that direction. So um, that's you know, how we'll get to our next step. Well, thank you very yep. much. And thank you for the tour of the um, playground today. That was really, that's a beautiful playground. And it's well, it's, um, it's, the grass is really coming in nicely. I'm, yeah. I'm very excited to see that. and. Um, it's going to be great to see the kids sliding on it this 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 winter. Um, again, we're we're hoping we'll see the the fence installed late sometime late November around the perimeter. That will that's going to really kind of define the field, so to speak. And um, and then luck, we'll be opening it in the in the fall of 2000 and uh, I can't see 19 already. Wow. Wow. So, that's amazing. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. Oh, I didn't have it before. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I I know the, the playground isn't going to be. That area isn't going to be uh, able to be fully used till the fall of next year. But I was really curious where um, RES is with their fundraising to add or replace a lot of the playground equipment that was there. I know they started. I don't know. What, I don't know what happened to it. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Beth, you want to come up and talk about, talk about that? And um, I didn't well, mention that the hard play area will be open this fall. So we're going to have a nice, large paved area back we've never had before, with a with a really nice basketball hoop for the kids to play with. So that will get done, you know, this fall before the pavement pants close. So that will be an, an, an immediate improvement we'll have in that site for the That's kids great. to enjoy. Thank you, Thank you both. Um, so I, you did the tour this evening, so you probably know there's pieces of the equipment that are being replaced, um, will be replaced, and the company has come out and gave the. Um, costs for that and should be in November. Yeah, been ordered to be in November. Mid November. Yeah. Um, we are looking at adding another piece of equipment, um, probably to be installed in the summer. Um, we're looking at equipment that would be more for upper um, extremity um, development for kids, more climbing. Okay. Uh, so between the fundraising money, yeah. I did inquire about how much we have in that account. It's about seven thousand. Um, and at some point we'll be bringing to you, we have um, an individual that's willing to donate up to 10000 So we're looking at a piece of equipment um, from different companies that would we could get a good price um, and be able to put a new piece of equipment with our existing equipment. That's terrific. Cool. Yeah. Good. That's great. Good. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Thanks. You're welcome. Bill, okay, next we're going to have um, Jordan Small Middle School and Raymond Elementary School. People <laughs> talk to us. So, Mr. Crockett and Mrs. Peavy, come on down. Well, thanks for inviting us. Um, my understanding was we would kind of give you an update of some initiatives and things we're focusing on, and also 
touch upon the wellness policy a bit and some of the components that go into that. And then if you have other questions, certainly be happy to go through those. Um, I don't have a fancy PowerPoint today or anything like that. It's just kind of hitting some highlights. Um, so K-8 writing implementation obviously is a district-wide initiative and um, we've been working on that uh, in both buildings, spending a lot of time with the planning pieces of that. Now that we're getting really down to exactly which units are going to happen and when, which units are going to have common scoring across either the school or grade levels across district. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts to that and um, also trying to support teachers who are still learning the model. So the units of study model is not simple and um, it, it takes more than a year for sure to, to really get a handle on it and then um, what we're asking folks to do is, is really a lot um, in a fairly short amount of time, I think. Um, so there's what, five units at some grades, four to five units at the elementary level and um, minimum of three units at the middle school level in both middle schools. So um, that's, a, that's a huge amount of planning and also working on your instructional practice. If you used to teach writing a little different way and now you're having to use this model, it's, it's quite an adjustment. Um, so that's an ongoing um, piece of work and a big focus. Um, obviously the math committee work that's going on, um, we have many teachers from both schools involved with that math committee and the planning of that. Um, and the two math coaches are in the buildings on, on a weekly basis working with teachers at, at in various ways. Um, so that, you know, for instance, um, when we had the professional development day, was it two weeks ago? Mm -hmm. I'm starting to run together a little bit, but um, you know, the, the ELA folks at, at Jordan Small had the whole day to focus on the writing units of study and individual time, group time, um, discussion time, and, and so forth. And there were components of writing training going on at RES as well. Meanwhile, folks who were teaching math at Jordan Small were working on data um, that they had available at that point. Uh, mostly from NWAs and looking at their kids, helping each other look at the kids they have in classes. So it was kind of a tag team approach with all five math teachers. Um, and then in the afternoon, Ellen Bailey was working with just those Jordan Small math teachers who spent her morning at Wyndham Middle. Um, so, you know, we worked to coordinate that and really give people the time they need to focus on this the big work. Um, we already talked to you a few weeks ago, or maybe it was more now, about grading practices at the middle school and high school level. That's, that's a work in progress at Jordan Small. No major changes to grading at RES. Um, also been working with the Jordan Small teachers around unit design, specifically with folks uh, from our AE staff, music, art, PE, all those folks, and um, some of the social studies and science teachers around unit planning, unit design, and then looking for ways to do more integration at grade levels across content. So the AE team is already well underway with that. Um, that's happening between music and art at seventh and eighth grade level. Um, there's some other things going on with applied tech and music at the seventh grade level. So we're starting to see more of that. What used to be really part of the middle school model when middle schools first started was to try to integrate. And we kind of got away from that a bit and I think we should not have. <laughs> so I'm trying to get more of that back and just getting people to think about sharing ideas and co-planning things and it, you know three or four heads are usually better than just one. So um, that's another ongoing piece of work at Jordan Small. Um, we've got the 90% reading goal K-2 to and um, that is in year three. So we started with kindergarten two years ago. They are now in second grade. Um, and I'm going to let Beth speak to some of the specifics about what that means. All right. Well, I did um, talk to you a little bit about the 90% goal last year. Um, so our first and second grade, um, our second grade teachers 
last year decided to be part of the 90% goal. It would have been this year that they would have been part of that. Um, they decided to team with the first and, uh, grade teachers. And so I think, you know, we had a lot of ups and downs because it was new. It was new for them and some learning curves that we um, had to adjust for this year. And some of the things we learned last year because um, we did between intervention um, time frames, we would have 25 days of interventions and then we would stop and look at the data and readjust um, our groupings. That took up time mm -hmm. and sometimes it didn't always align with the district assessment calendar. Um, and so there was a lot of stop and go and um, also which impacted us was MEAs because we did have m many children in third and fourth grade um, that needed accommodations and then we need um, staffing to meet those accommodations so then we kind of are on a hold for providing those interventions with staffing in the classroom um, so this year we've aligned when our assessments are to when we're looking at the data and but we're not stopping the interventions we're not going 25 days and then stopping around we're going to continue with our interventions um, collect our data readjust our groupings as needed um, I think our third round last year was when we really were um, diving into exactly what students needed. Um, so this year we've started out in that process. And for our first and second grade students in, during interventions, so the students that are struggling the most that with the traditional interventions we've been putting in place have not been working, we're adding a component of um, visual imagery so to letter sounds and um, letters and words. So really using their um, visual mind um, to remember letters and their patterns because part of reading is being able to visualize. If children are not able to visualize a story, it impacts comprehension. Um, but we also need to have that um, visual memory of how letters are put together that equals the sounds and make up the words. Um, so that's a strategic um, intervention that we're doing. We're also pushing in with our special ed staff. So this year, because of scheduling, along with our interventionist, the teacher who I sent out for training this year on that visual imagery, um, and also special ed are in that classroom. Mm -hmm. So they're getting intense um, interventions. So that's where we are right now. I, you know, it's not easy for the teachers. This is a lot of work that they're putting in and planning and having to meet and finding the time to meet and making those adjustments. But, you know, I think the students transition well and they move from class to class. They know the standard operating procedures. They get right to work. They have 45 minutes. There's a lot that's built in in the 45 minutes because it's just not sit down instruction. There's also movements. Um, you know, they learn how to do the egg or the Superman pose, all that impacts your upper core development. Crossing the midline is really important. We do lazy eights because it Im if you're not able to cross the midline, impacts reading, it impacts writing, making sure kids, students have hand dominance, which impact writing. Um, so all those components, it's just not just sit down at a table and instruction. So there's a lot built in. There's um, movement with the de different letter sounds. They do some sign language sound uh, movements. Uh, so it's, a, I've invited you, and I know we tried to schedule it last year. Come in and see what they do. It's, it's, it's amazing. So I'm hoping, you know, this year we can um, be more solid in what we're doing with less impact um, of not having interventions based on scheduling. Can yes. Please demonstrate the Superman. Yeah. <laughs> on camera? Yeah. Can we the won't. camera go off? <laughs> I'll do it if the camera's off. No one's, no one's looking. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned it. I wonder if you could Google it. You can Google it. It's basically you're on your stomach. Oh. oh. <laughs> so I would have to go on the floor and your arms are out, your legs are off the ground. Okay. So that's why I'm like, hmm, I'm not going to go do that. But that was funny. <laughs> so what 
grades do this? Is this a kindergarten? Mm -hmm. It's kindergarten, first, first and second grade. So mm -hmm. the second grade kids are doing the Superman pose? Oh, yes. And, and they do the egg, and there's all that's these different um, poses that they have to sustain. And it's really interesting to watch the kids that are not able to do that right. and yeah. um, really try and, or they can only do the Superman pose for very short period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and that it, those are the kids that struggle sometimes with actually sitting in their seats sure. and attending because they have to hold up their body mm -hmm. and um, be focused. And if they're not able to do that and they fatigue faster, you're going to have kids that look a little bit more distracted in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's just not about learning your letter sounds and your words. It's about getting your body to function that crosses the midline, that's using both sides of your brains to access your learning. I have to say too, we might not have been able to visit and see it happen, but there was a fantastic little video made at the iMovie Festival. I think it was like a kindergarten or first grade class. Mm -hmm. It was a really great video that demonstrated a whole lot of it. Um, so that was really neat to see because not only did they take it there, but they ran with it and there were animal costumes and it was yeah. adorable. <laughs> it was well done. That's Do you have great. any more questions or poses? <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll address also a little bit of um, the wellness components. I mean, Beth started to talk about how movement is incorporated into, into the classroom. Um, and just for general logistics, we have uh, recess at RES, 25 minutes, four days a week. Um, for all grade levels, and all grade levels have at least 45 minutes of phys ed a week as well. Um, and our phys ed teachers have been great about trying to incorporate some of the crossing the midline exercises and, and kind of deepening their um, repertoire with, with the kids too, uh, to support the reading component. Um, and Jordan Small, you may not know, actually we have uh, recess up through eighth grade. And we, we added that three years ago now, I think. Um, we basically call it outdoor break because it doesn't look quite as much like recess when you're 13 years old. Yeah. But uh, although for some of them it looks exactly like <laughs> <laughs> But um, they have about a 15 minute outdoor break before or after lunch, um, which some of them just use to socialize, but others use to, you know, shoot around or play a little touch football or so forth. And fifth and sixth grade has always had recess. Um, and theirs is about 25 minutes more towards the elementary side of things. And that's a daily occurrence. Um, phys ed at Jordan Small is twice a week for 42 minutes when you're in fifth and sixth grade, 47 minutes when you're in seventh and eighth grade. Some of the eighth graders do not take phys ed because they elect to take Spanish music classes and trying to work in um, health as a requirement and tech and so forth. It just doesn't allow for it. So they, some, some opt out in eighth grade. Um, but a lot of our kids are involved with after-school activities as well, so or um, non-school activities that are, you know, very physical. It's just umpteen dance classes a week and things like that. Um, and then other motor breaks and activities that go on more so at the elementary level. Um, some of the teachers use Go Noodle, which I'm not exactly sure what that looks like, but. And I'm not <laughs> she didn't make it. Um, and other motor break activities that you know might be something where you're following a video or just a simple activity that the teacher is leading. Um, we also have kids who have various plans, whether it's 504, RTI, special ed, that have motor breaks built in. So we have some steppers. Um, I can't remember what you call that. Stair steppers. Uh, yeah, I guess. But we, just we also call push. it the fit pass. Yeah. So any student, not just students that have an RTI plan, can use the fit pass and go out and use the stepper. Um, and you, there's a little timer, and they do their stepping, and they can go back to class. So anybody has access to it's that. It's an aerobic step. Yes. So yeah, that's what I couldn't remember the, the word for that. Um, and another thing that's kind of taken off over the last, not even year, is, is doing more around mindfulness and body awareness and so um, the whole the whole school is involved with that you know just different types of breathing exercises little stretching exercises um, it really helps kids transition you know going like <coughs> I was down by a kindergarten class the other day and they were doing rainbow breathing 
um, which we can demonstrate. If, okay. if you know. <laughs> 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 no, you're just breathing. Are you breathing and making the rainbow? Or are you are you making the rainbow? Yeah. And yeah. Okay. Um, Very so you know, it was probably what three minutes, four minutes, yeah. something like that. And then they transitioned to one of their specials. So it kind of got them focused again and settled. Um, and so, you know, part of the physical activity is helping kids be aware and having self-regulation skills. Um, and that's not just for kindergarten and first grade. Yeah. Um, we all need that once in a while. And um, anything you want to add on that? Am I missing something? I just want to add that um, I know when we think of physical activity, we think recess for kids. But it's, you know, for some kids that actually escalates them, dysregulates them. Too much movement can increase um, more activity with them and they don't necessarily settle right back down into the classroom. Mm -hmm. So the mindfulness and different strategies, often kids where you give them those, the physical activity, you also have to um, complement it with a calm down activity so they can transition to learning. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when you get those kids right after recess and they're coming to, back to your class and you're going right into math or whatever, and you haven't done anything like a story to calm them down or, you know, just a breathing activity, and you're wondering why they're not focused even though they've been playing around, mm -hmm. and why are they struggling with readjusting back into the classroom. So it's, there, you know, there's many components to what makes kids successful in the classroom, and we're trying to meet all those needs and fit them all in in a schedule during the day. I just want to add in music, um, and more so probably at the K-2 level, Mrs. Gordon does a gr wonderful job of adding a lot of physical movement yeah, yeah. with her singing and activities. When I go in there, we're moving around quite a bit. Um, you know, and it might be singing, and then they do a running tag thing, and then they get to sing again. Um, so they're not always sitting and just singing. So there's another component of where they get movement that's incorporated throughout their day. I think in third and fourth do some folk dancing or they That's learn right. about some cultural And then they share dancing. that in an assembly. Um, so I think that kind of hits all those pieces. Um, so if you have questions. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, Randy, I wanted to go back to the writing program sure, for a moment. Yeah. Is that um, the Lucy right. Calkins or? Yeah. Um, have you... Like, how often do you ask your teachers for feedback on that program? Is this like a, a weekly um, event, or and the reason why I ask? I get a lot of feedback at times, <laughs> not not because I ask, but I well, do get some good. feedback. No, that's yes. that's good. And what are the teachers saying? <clears throat> this is hard. This is a lot of work. And how do I put it all in? And how I get, how do I get it to fit? Um, and I've got to. You know, I'm worried about losing reading instructional time because I'm trying to get writing increased. And, you know, it's, it's a challenge. It's, it's trying to find that balance in the ELA program. Um, and I, I think part of it, too, is that when you're doing something new, it's not as fluid. Yeah. And so, I mean, if you look at the Lucy Calkins manual, you would have panic if, as a teacher. If you just looked at it and you never knew anything about it, you would, you would like, oh, my God, because it's... She writes a script for each unit. So a novice teacher could theoretically use the script, but it would take you a long time <laughs> to deliver the program. And I think what people are working on now is where they can move faster or where they should not spend as much time and, and knowing that they're going to be using the program through the course of the year. Like, you don't make sure your mini lessons are mini lessons. They shouldn't be 30 or 40 minutes long. You don't have to have mastery. You know, like every kid doesn't get need to get every piece of that mini lesson that day, because you're going to use the program again, and they're going to come back through it, and and trying to not, you know, get the published piece to be ready for the newspaper. It's like they're going to be writing a lot, so you're going to give them X amount of time, work on the published piece, and then there's another unit coming, you know, six ten weeks down the road. So it's 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 been a big undertaking and and stressful for the staff. Um, and some give and take and some haggling, I would call it, <laughs> a little bit. Um, like, you know, people that are pretty good teachers that come into me pulling their hair out going, I just don't see how I'm going to do this all. Mm -hmm. And we've had to adjust, you know, our expectations a little bit. Um, but there, that's okay. Has there been any concern shared that it's too rigorous of a program? I think, 
it's been harder for the upper grades to jump in because the kids that they're getting haven't been in the program. So you tr for them, it seems like night and day. Um, I mean, I think there's a collective expectation around we want kids to be good communicators in the written forms. <laughs> and we want them to be ready for high school. And, and we want them to be building towards that post-secondary piece. And writing, you know, along the way over the years has not, I don't think, at least for Jordan Small, it, it, it kind of, the quality of the writing had diminished with the kids, not because of the kids necessarily, because other things took up more time. And, and so we're trying to get that quality to be high. So it is rigorous, I mean, no doubt about yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, my personal experience, uh, I've got a son in sixth grade and I looked at one of the assignments and it gives an example of what not to do or what a, what a writing piece might look like and then what a writing piece mm -hmm. should look like or better. And on a sixth grade level, this example that I looked at, I mean, you could pull, you could pull 20 adults off the street and ask them to write a story, and you're not going to get an opening paragraph anywhere close to. I mean, right. You might find one person that can do this opening paragraph the way that it's said for the sixth grader. So, I mean, that's my personal experience, and I know in the district there's a few teachers that are excited about the program. So I was just wondering what your take or what you're yeah. hearing. Well, some are excited, and some are excited because <laughs> because it's it's a lot. To, to it's you know for some people it's a huge you basically learn how to teach writing all over again and that's that's not easy and it's a little scary um, but we'll get there and and you know even if we don't hit the perfect example that you saw in the book the bar is really high but that doesn't mean coming up a little short of the bar is a bad thing right but not this far from the bar <laughs> I mean my opinion like I mean if you don't hit the ultimate goal as a writer as a kid you're going to be a lot closer with this program than you would have been had we left things a little more squishy, as somebody <laughs> likes to quote me on, who's not I present. I <laughs> um, Lucy Coggins. Um, you talked about training. Is everybody trained in your building? Uh, I think so. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, so what everybody's been doing this for at least... Some people were in early kind of the, the pilot group, and then others came in after that. Of course, we've had new staff hired, and so right, they're, right. they're trying to get up to speed, although some of them had experience with it in other districts. Um, it's, it's not like a one and done. Oh, I mean, I there's the I initial training right. that everybody's yeah. had, and then there's the coaching and the support and the you know, um, mutual group support societies that are formed <laughs> to try to right. figure out. They're helping each other, which is great. Um, so it's an ongoing training or an ongoing experience. Okay. Yeah. All right. I guess I misunderstood. And then Melissa <coughs> Wong comes in, comes right. in and does maybe less than March. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I get it for like kindergarten, first grade for, for, for the little people, but, but to the point of his sixth grader, when you have kids that are up that high and this is brand new to them, how do you, how do you grade them? The same when they haven't had any of that past experience, and we all know the younger you teach somebody something, the easier it is to learn it. Right. Do you, is the grading the same for the sixth grader so, who has? Yeah, well, I have no idea where I am. Versus right. So the what we've done at the middle school level is is say the units of study have eight or nine indicators on a rubric that you can score, but. Well, let's narrow that down per unit. So over the course of the year, this, the students would be scored on all eight or nine indicators, but within the first unit they do, they might only be scored on four or five. So you're trying to just focus in on some components of writing, not go from zero to 60 all at once. So it's, um, for instance, you know, writing a good lead in is kind of a good place to start. So let's make sure we score that in the first unit. You know, um, author's voice is a little more nebulous um, and harder to, so let's not worry about scoring voice in the first unit. And maybe we want to focus on certain pieces of, of mechanics in the first unit more than we're going to need to in the second or third unit. So you can't just, you can't just take the whole program and jump in and do it all at once 
at sixth grade or seventh grade, or you've got to kind of build up to it because the students aren't used to it either, and neither is you know it's it's a long process. This is a this is a big <laughs> shift. Well, so. This this fall is the the third year, right? Because the pilot year was fifteen sixteen. Okay, so. Third year at the elementary level. At the I'm elementary, not, not at the. I'm not sure that that's true of the middle school okay. level. Um, it's more like the second year for at least the Jordan Small Middle School okay. staff. I'm not sure about Wyndham. I think maybe some people might have been in that pilot group three years back, but not very many. But I'm just guessing. Okay. I don't speak for Mr. Pat because that will get me in trouble. <laughs> uh, just one last thing. Is it a big emotional impact on, on those? sixth and seventh graders. I mean, not for nothing, but you're a lot more focused on looking stupid when you get <laughs> that age than you are in second grade. You know, second grade, you're kind of like along with everybody else. I so don't think it's, school, it, yeah, I don't think it's any more of a, a personal struggle than it would have been before. It's okay. not like we didn't have okay. anybody doing any writing. Yeah. So kids that struggle as writers okay. that, that, you know, we try to put supports in place for them. Um, I mean, writing's so individualized, though, in a way. You know, if a teacher is savvy, they can say, well, I'm going to partner those two kids together because I don't want that one to be overwhelmed by the writing level of this one. So mm -hmm. when they're doing those peer edits and those types yeah. of things um, or, or structuring peer editing or class work, mm -hmm. sharing stuff in such a way that it's safe, that it's, you know, meaningful, but, but you've got to be, you have a little finesse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And students, we're just saying as a whole writing, some students struggle with that, but they may do well in one unit versus another because of the type of writing they have to do. So one might be more research-based versus a narrative. Mm -hmm. And so they may have that as a strength, and narratives may not be anything that they're interested in. So when we look at students, it's not necessarily a blanket statement that they <coughs> do well. It's what areas do they are successful at and what areas are more of a struggle in their writing. I try. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? All right. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Thank you. Always Thank good you. to hear. Okay. Um, the board will review the 2018-2019 budget timeline. Mr. Prince, are you? Yes. So Terry has issued up the full document. Like me, it might take a little while to get used to it. Yeah. Um, I do better when we actually get into the budget season and, and need to use it. But um, pretty much the green squares are your typical board meetings um, that you meet every other week. And then the yellow is um, useful to you, but also useful to the administrative team in that there are certain dates where things are well required before you even begin to look at the budget. Um, you know, between uh, central office staff and the administrators, there's times where we need them to give us budget numbers and Stacy in the office will begin to develop the budget. So some of those yellow components, and I'm gonna also make sure that Chris can jump in on this mm -hmm. too because he's part of his baby as well. And then um, after that, the blue is, <coughs> I would say, definitely a <coughs> component to the board as to when we come to you and begin to talk to you about the big ticket items with the A-team, when we come and actually deliberate over the budget. Um, this format, what's different about this format, the good news is that you get to see everything that you, you'll be working on this year. Typically in the past, you just had a budget timeline, uh, but now what you have is the budget timeline, but it's immersed in all your meetings throughout the year. And I would have to say, when you look at the budget components, it's really no different than what you typically have had in the past. So if you're working on budget last year on certain things in April, those same types of things are going to happen this mm -hmm. April. Chris? Yeah, 
Chris. I don't so know. I just the only thing I'd add is that this this document is in your shared folder, which then will allow you to increase the font and the size because it is <laughs> it is a little difficult and it doesn't print very well as, as far as the size goes. But um, the budget initial budget document has already been loaded to the shared drive for our administrators as far as what needs to be required and turned into Stacy so that when we start the ball rolling and so as early as beginning of December we'll start working as an administrative team on setting some priorities I know we'll also be working with finance to be setting some parameters and some guardrails for where you would like to see this budget coming in as um, but then looking at that initial um, presentation to all of you assuming that the weather doesn't impact it like it did last year that last week of February um, and then having the opportunity for the month of March and also the beginning of April for board to learn more about the budget and also for the board to have some chance to deliberate um, on that budget. So Sandy's correct. There's not much different in here as far as timeline goes. Just Terry put it in a little different format. Um, what's also nice about this for now the view that are becoming some more proficient Google users that if weather changes or meetings change we can quickly update the calendar and um, and make sure that it's always correct for you um, so that you know what to plan for. But we'll begin this process. Again, the forms are already in the shared drive. Um, we're about six weeks away from starting to build a budget. Are you have any questions about the timeline? It's not, I just wanted to give you the information. Um, just so you guys all know, our meeting on March 20th is the day before my birthday. Oh, so that is good. Cake would be okay. Cake. Okay. Speak to the baker. We'll save the birthday plate. I like okay. chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> we know. <laughs> All right. First of all, I'd like to say that I do like the new format. Uh, mm -hmm. Definitely helpful. Secondly, though, last budget season, if any of you remember, um, I felt crunched for time. And what seemed to be missing was an extra meeting for deliberation. Because as it works out, if the budget is presented and we need to deliberate, if we end up deliberating and saying, no, we need some changes made, mm -hmm. then it needs to go back. And then those changes need to get made. And then it needs to come back to us. So I would propose that we do not vote on the budget until April 10th, okay. that's before school vacation. Mm -hmm. Set that as a vote and leave April 3rd as a second deliberation. Okay. okay, I think that's a good idea. Time. And if I remember correctly, we were compounded last year because I think we scheduled, we had to cancel two separate budget nights because of, of storms and you're absolutely right it yeah. really all crunched in and Dom was end. away on vacation yep. one time when we yeah. would have had a meeting Anybody so yeah right. I think an extra meeting would be true. very yeah. helpful so and if we don't need it we don't need right. it right. We just, right. Right. Good. right I think some some challenges that we are going to have this year with budget um, obviously we're going to be the, as Don has well explained to all of you in the past there's an expense side of the house and there's a revenue side of the house um, with a new um, governor and a new legislature and um, new bills being proposed. Uh, as far as the revenue side of the house, it may take a little extra time this year before we start to see what some of those initial subsidy calculations are gonna be. Um, by law, they're supposed to be to us by February 1st, but we know that that and in the past has actually been impacted by um, you know what the legislature is actually working on. But again, with a new governor and a new administration coming on board, um, we could see some differences. Positive or negative, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Correct. And initially, and this is just a point of um, latest word, is that the governor, the current sitting governor, will be setting uh, a proposed budget, which then will be picked up um, by whatever governor is then coming into place. And then obviously there could be changes up and down based on that. Are we all set to move on? Okay. Um, now it says, Janny Cummings, board chair, will present an update of the board goals. So, let me do that. Um, you, were, you were supposed to have in your um, folders the board goals, but uh, we don't seem to have them, so I will... Um, we have the topics, but not the goals. 
So I will talk to you briefly about them. Some of you may have them, some not. I was going to say, are they in the email? Do we get them emailed? No, they were supposed to be within the packet. Right, I just didn't know. No, not in the. Okay. So, um, so here's what I wanted to say in the. Even if you had them, I would be saying this. Uh, we didn't want to get to May and say, uh, what were those board goals again? Um, so, um, so we wanted to give, um, make sure we make deliberate um, plans to implement the, our goals. So when we met as a leadership team talking about the different goals, the first goal that we talked about was goal one, go figure. And uh, which is to establish clear, consistent evaluation guidelines and pay expectations, ranges, raise percentages, et cetera, for administrators, for administrations with administrators within the district. So um, we had an idea that we would kind of give these goals to various. Uh, of the various committees and have them work on them and then report back. So um, first one we gave was to the Finance Committee. We thought this would be a good thing for the Finance Committee and to work on and report back in March. But um, when we talked to Pete about it, he had um, s uh, thought of some things that I frankly had not thought of. And so we thought that this would be a good opportunity to discuss them and get the sense of the board about where you'd like to go. Pete, would you like to? Um, yeah, I mean, when it was proposed that, um, that this be a task of the Finance Committee, um, as I started thinking about it, I mean, we don't have anything in place right now. So to do this, we're basically going to be building from scratch. And I, for one, even though I'm in finance, I don't have the HR background. Mm -hmm. um, and quite frankly, I wouldn't have the time. And so I think this is such an ascent, you know, people's pay is very personal, very sensitive. So I think that something as sensitive of this nature and as important as it is should be tasked out or hired out. I mean, that's basically what I'm trying to say. Or whether, it, you know, I don't know if we consult with the MSMA and see if there is stuff in place that we can use as a resource or whether we need to um, hire some sort of a consultant. But I think to do this right uh, and to protect ourselves moving forward, that it would be best not to task this to. Just that committee. Yeah, right. correct. Okay. I need help um, getting this defined. What what end product do we want? What I'm, I'm not clear. I guess I need I need help. Clear about the goal itself. Clear about the goal itself. What at the end of this year? What information do we want to have? What do we want? What do we want? Sure. I'm sorry because we don't. Have okay, it. I may be able to read it again. Thank you. Establish clear, consistent evaluation guidelines and pay expectations, ranges, raise percentages, etc., for administrative. I wrote goals again, but within the district, I think it's administrative administration within the district. When I hear evaluation guidelines, that doesn't feel like it's a board job no, because know. they are not our employees. Right. That would be a sandy job right. as far as the guidelines. <clears throat> so that piece, um, I'm not sure that that would be part of the goal. We're not. I'm, I've never been involved in in the evaluation of any of the administrators. Right. Yeah, and I mean, so help me. I no, and you keep looking at me, but I didn't come no, up with that. I didn't come up with the goal. We came up with the goals as a board, but. Um, yeah, well, which brings up a larger point that. Board goals don't necessarily have to be things that the board physically does the work to accomplish. No, they, and I agree. Yeah, we they can be implement. things that we're making sure right. get done within the right. district. Okay, that's another good point. Would you, anyone else like to speak to? So, it? to me, when I hear this, when I remember when we had, you know, um, when we brought Chris on as the assistant superintendent, we all went, well, what is an assistant superintendent? 
start as and how do we you know determine what they make and do we just base it off who was here before but they've been here for a long time and they bring you know so to me this is something where we want to make sure we have the bones to be able to say if somebody leaves mm -hmm. this is what we're looking for this is where they can expect to come in at based on their experience and you know again that doesn't mean that we have to do it but we want to make sure that it's there that that the bones of it are there so that there you take away some of that unknown like what the heck are we doing here we have the structure to make sure we're not in that position mm -hmm. I think part of that might have come from the fact that what gets done out in the, the business world versus what gets done in this world is different because when you hire somebody out out in the business world, you hire them and there are all those factors. I don't care who they're replacing. You look at the factors, what is it, are they going to be doing the same job, how much experience do they come with, stuff like that, and you evaluate all that. Mm -hmm. In this world, it seems to be if a person leaves, whoever comes in, even if they've only had six months experience, they walk into the same contract. contract. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that, and I don't know because that was not my goal, but I think that might have been, that that was, was I think that was part of, part of what mm -hmm. caused that. But, but that's kind of, but I don't know, to Kate's thing, I, I don't know where we go with it. I, I mean, know. other than, you know. Well, this was our mm -hmm. way of Wondering. <laughs> Wondering. Um, I don't know that we have any particular guidance. Does anybody have any ideas about what we should, where we should go from this, or do you, we want to think about it some more? And we may want to workshop it, but yeah, yeah. let's let's. Why don't be we be careful how much we? Yeah, let's table say. this and workshop it. Um, can we, which is a, which is not a verb. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can can, can we um, get information from? Yeah, I'm sure we can. That's oh, part sure. of the. But yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. So. I just, I just. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to workshop it, but. The sooner the better. I mean, mm -hmm. we're oh, no. in November. Oh, no, it's right. But. Yeah, I hope we can clearly define what it is at the end of the day we're looking for for this right. goal because I'm, I'm, totally not clear at all. Well, I think that we'll put that on the punch list. And um, and we'll talk about it at our next meeting about what can we how we can move forward. Okay, goal number two was, um, and I don't have the exact wordage of that, but the goal number two was about the facilities use and how um, ongoing and long term facilities use, and we decided to give that to the facilities committee. Go figure. Um, <laughs> and so um, that's still in the works and um, you'll get more information about that but that's we're, we're going to be updated um, and goal number three has several different parts to it but um, it was about uh, communication and consistent communication across mm -hmm. grade levels across the district and so um, the first one a the district is going to focus on the implementation of the math and writing curricula and the grading and reporting policy. So those two, the those three things that they'll be focused on. And we're going to be scheduling periodic updates on the strategic plan and how, this is Chris's term, intersects with board goals. And we'll be getting reports uh, on an ongoing basis. So that's just to report about what we've been working on and how we're going to continue to work on that. Any questions or? We will get back to you uh, very soon, next meeting or the one following, um, about goal number one and what we've found out. Okay. Did you write down that we were going to be doing that so that I will remember that we're going to do that? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we are, um, we are tasked with uh, the main school board association res resolutions. And um, that is um, when we go to the MSMA um, School Board um, Association um, workshop convention uh, next week, um, 
they have an, a resident, I mean, a delegate assembly, which is a delegate, and our delegate is Marge. Um, and they're be going to be voting on the direction uh, for that they would like the um, MSBA or the MSMA to um, push to. And so we had several resolutions, and we want to vote on them. I know you've all had a chance to look at these and take copious notes about what your feelings on them are. So, but we did get some information from Charlotte Bates about, from MSMA, about the fact that we did need to vote on them individually as a board. Okay, so I will entertain a motion. I move to support, and sorry, I move to support the proposed MSBA resolution. CDS moved to public schools. Second. It's moved and seconded. Do we have to read it? No. People don't know what it is. If we don't read it, do we care? <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it's for no. you. It's for you, right? It's for you. So well, and all of you, because you all have to know what it is. Okay. No, I, d I don't think so. I don't think we need to read the whole thing. I mean, I w and if people want to read it, the whole thing, and somebody who has different glasses can do that. Um, <laughs> no, that's fine. I was actually asking. Okay. All right. But can we give the gist of it or? It's or to discuss it? moving CDS to s the public schools. <laughs> I can read the rationale. <laughs> okay. Would this you like me to read the rationale? What is CDS? Child Development Services. Services. Would you like me to read the rationale? I've read them, so I just, so, okay. yeah. They figure we're, be we're better equipped to handle it in one spot, and it's a preempt, this is my own, preempt mm -hmm. to going into school. So right. you're basically getting these little children ready Go into the regular school. So it's not all it's children. Not all of us. It's just it's children that it's only CDS. need special, 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 services. special yes. services. And there's a lot of them, by the way. Okay. So it has been moved and seconded. Is there any public comment about this? <laughs> okay. Um, board discussion. I think it should be said that um, the rationale in supporting this, it's contingent on state funding required right. to provide these right. services. And that's a critical, critical piece is the money. Hear that, Mrs. Gavoni? I, I heard you heard that? I heard that. Um, <laughs> and, and the other thing I think people, uh, I, I mean, I know it's for us to decide, but people need to know that this is not something that's unique to us. There are a lot of um, schools, districts, or whatever that oh sure this have already implemented right this. Um, but it's a lot of consideration. Yeah, the space, the getting, the specialists, the all of that stuff that we would have to work towards. Well, yeah. So that's the thing, and just so I understand it, so we would provide the services. Mm -hmm. using our staff and it would just we would receive funding using our staff and our space right. and typically child development services is a separate organization that identified preschool special ed students and so they would be in contact with us when they were going to come to kindergarten they would have all the assessments done the identification they would have those kids in the programs that now will be the public education op um, um, requirement to take that over. So it does have implications for space, staff, and um, hopefully it would be funded uh, appropriately. Um, and I think the challenge we run into now, we have, it's hard to find special ed teachers and um, speech people and OT people, but we would have to take that on. Does that look like it could be regionalized? Absolutely. Um, you know, we might try to collaborate with two or three other districts to take this on. But it, the problem I have with it is all the big questions haven't been answered. Um, space alone is, is big for mm -hmm. us. So it is a shift. And um, it's something that uh, I don't want to discourage you with, but it, it's going to take a lot of planning and time, and um, it will take resources, and hopefully the state will provide that. I think just so, just so, 
everybody knows, this isn't basically implementing it. Mm -hmm. This no, is this is um, uh, legislature to convene a task force to inform a plan, to come up with a plan, and it says state funding must be adequate to hire staff and provide appropriate services to all eligible children to avoid the kind of shortages documented under the current system. One of the task force's goals will be to develop a detailed funding plan. So it's not, this is not saying we agree that it needs to be done. It, I think it's saying we agree yeah. there needs to be a task force to look at this to see can it be done mm -hmm. and how would it be funded, et cetera. And I think that this one in particular, I mean, how many times just tonight have we said, I wish we'd caught that, I wish we knew that, mm -hmm. I wish we could have helped earlier. Well, right. this is a step to finding to out find how it. we can help earlier and how we can we can be there to offer those supports and, and, and those services when they're really, like earlier the better, the, when we can actually help these kids and be impactful and hopefully prevent really rough high school experiences. So um, I, this definitely isn't saying we're gonna vote on it and do it tomorrow, but this is saying let's find out how we can make this happen and I think it's really, really important. Yeah. Um, Kate? No, no sir. Yeah, and the, and the last piece of that is, you know, it says, our support is contingent on the state funding right. required to provide these services in school or in an appropriate outside placement because we cannot continue to have the kind of shortfalls that have plagued CDS in the past or ask local taxpayers to pick up any of these costs. And as we all know, well, some of you out there who are teachers, that you, you get some of these children who, if they had been able to get <coughs> services prior to before they came to school, we wouldn't have. Might have made a difference. Yes, thank you. Might have made. So anyway, so it's only for we really just look for the task force. This is not to implement the program. Okay. Substitute parenting. Yeah. <coughs> um, so it's been moved and seconded, and we've had discussion. Mm -hmm. All those in favor of this. All those opposed? All those abstaining? Okay, thank you. Um, Wait a minute. We a yes? Yes, that passes. Okay. Just so I know how to vote. Okay. Um, motion two. I move to support the proposed MSBA resolution school safety. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any public comment? Okay. Any board discussion? I can read it. <laughs> <laughs> to support public schools' responsibility to keep children safe, Maine School Board Association advocates the following comprehensive approach. Ongoing risk assessment, not only for active shooter attacks, but other disruptors, that could put students or staff at risk, increased focus on social and emotional support, training on early warning signs around school perpetrators of violence, and programs like Say Something, which encourage students to go to an adult with concerns about a potentially violent peer, increased funding in the, re in the revolving school renovation fund that includes school safety projects as priorities, and support for state and federal funding funding for the school resource officers where appropriate. We also support tasking the department's facilities office to advise, collect, and disseminate best practices on keeping children safe. Any discussion? I would just tell you that I support that only because I work with security and I work with schools and there's a lot of our schools in the state that are not where we are. Right. We're in a good place as you guys all know from listening to the plan, but uh, there's a lot of places that aren't. This doesn't really tell you what this, I'm not sure they're, what they're saying here is the best way to go about it, but uh, you know, we do need to, to look at that. So I'm, I'm not sure how to vote on it. I mean, I would say yes, I'm in support of <coughs> doing something like that, but I'm not sure they have the answers. Right, I talked to um, Scott Fournier, is it Scott? Yeah. Um, this afternoon or this evening about this, and he said, we're doing this. Yeah. And, um, but he's very. But there's supportive. a lot of places that aren't that exactly. don't have the funding or, or, or are way behind what we are at. Right. 
Yeah, I don't see any downside to this one. Yeah, I, I don't either. So, <laughs> anybody else have a comment to make? Okay. All those in favor? All those opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. I would entertain a motion for number three. I move to support the proposed MSBA resolution, gun-free schools. The main school board's association. Sorry, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was so. The main school board's association supports the current state ban on guns, loaded and unloaded, on school property, on school property, and opposes any legislative attempts to amend that prohibition. The ban is both symbolic and practical. It affirms ours and the nation's belief that schools should be safe havens and does not invite intended or unintended tragedy by allowing loaded guns on school grounds. Suggestions that schools can somehow monitor whether guns in cars are safely locked and unloaded are unworkable. It's been moved and seconded, and <laughs> I read it. Um, any public comment about this? Any board discussion? I will just raise my flag. I looked into this, and uh, um, one of the concerns was this watering down of Maine's current, which would be changing. But this is the same. What that bill was, was this, and it's been killed, so it's kind of a waste of time at this point, uh, was, was to mirror what the federal requirements were. So for, since 1990, there was a, um, a federal law stating that you couldn't have guns. If they were, they were to be in a lockbox with the ammunition separate. So they were just looking to do that. It really wasn't for the hunters. They kind of, they, they threw that in. It looked like a lot of people threw that in as that's what was the reason. But it really came down to, from what I was looking at, and I learned most of this this week. So if you were a person, say a woman who has a restraint order or whatever, you would, and you want to drop your kids off to school when you were, someone was after you, you would have to go home, drop your handgun off, and then go back and drop your kid off. And it's, it puts a lot of hardship for someone who's just driving through, mm -hmm. if they're in that case. Now, most of us don't have that problem, thank mm -hmm. God. But, so I'm not sure that I totally agree with what they're saying. Although, the law has already been dropped, so I don't know what the discussion right. is. But. So I guess what I'm saying is, if you're dropping your kid off, you carry sure. a loaded firearm for a living right. or for whatever, and you're not a policeman, you're a criminal if you if you're on school property. You're on school property. Right. And I, I think that's probably going a bit far in mine. Any other discussion? Concerns? Okay. All those in favor of this, raise your hand. Opposed? No abstentions. Okay. Um, number four is, uh, would it, I would entertain a motion for number four. I move to support the proposed MSBA resolution for efficiency-based diplomas. Second. It's been moved and seconded, and now I will read what that means. Proficiency-based diplomas. The Maine School Boards Association supports the ongoing work toward the implementation of proficiency-based diploma systems in Maine schools. The work to improve proficiency-based systems must be done by educational stakeholders and be in the best interest of all students. The system must be explained well in our schools and in the community. Critical elements include teacher training, multiple pathways to accommodate all learners, capacity to offer quality instruction in designated content areas, and the ability to support struggling students and challenge those who, ex who exceed proficiency goals. Any discussion from the public? I am Rebecca Cole. I teach first grade at the primary school, and I'm a Wyndham resident. I'm also the president of Sebago East Shore Education Association, and I sit on the Maine Education, edu Maine Education Association Board of Directors, representing District I, which covers from Gardner to Wyndham. Um, my big wonder about this particular resolution um, because, as we know, the legislation has been overturned as far as proficiency-based diplomas being a statewide requirement, and so I'm wondering if pushing this work forward, there have been any considerations about the cost of professional development, um, students who are 
staying for a fifth or maybe even a sixth year to earn their proficiency-based diploma, um, what there might, what other costs might be associated with that it would increase our building populations. So those are just some of my concerns about this particular item. Um, Chris, mm -hmm. um, when they basically came out with, you know, well, shot the other one down and said, you know, you can or you cannot proceed, and I think <coughs> our district made a decision that we were going to go forward with. We're going to make the decision to keep some elements of proficiency. We're not going to a pure proficiency grading system, but um, the discussion we've had in policy is that at least at the high school level, that credits are based on proficiency, which really leans more towards making sure we have robust remediation plans when kids are in courses so that in order to meet course credit, meet course requirements, you're actually meeting the requirements of that course. So um, we, I guess if you can best word is, um, I don't want to say cherry picked, but we have pulled the elements of proficiency, which is high quality instruction, making sure that students have um, ample opportunity <coughs> for remediation and that, again, credits are based upon kids' mastery of, of concepts. So if, if they were to implement this again, we would have to go back to the full, we could do what we're doing now. The, the elements of what we were doing, the, the, the point in which the resolution actually, I think, is kind of underlying trying to argue for is that one of the problems with proficiency, which was never ever determined, was how do we work with students who receive special education services. Right. Um, and from the beginning, your policy committee as a board um, worked through uh, policy in which the IEPs determine the level of proficiency so that um, students can meet that, which was counter to what was being proposed in the law, but we said we were going to go ahead and do that anyway as part of our policy. Um, in listening to the resolution, that's one of the components that would still have to be um, determined. So my hope is that when you go to the delegate assembly and you bring a discussion about this, that you um, take whatever our vote is, but also bring the concerns that uh, Becca stated about everything that she said about how we are to manage that in the fifth year and the sixth year perhaps and how do we work with children who um, are at Special second grade level at this but at sixth grade level at another what how do we do that how do we manage that um, what are the intended and the unintended consequences of this right so, because there's nothing in here right so, so which means they haven't resolved it right and they at the delegate assembly, as you know, because you've mm -hmm. been at, they, there's a big discussion about this, and sometimes this is changed. This resolution is changed, so it's this is our vote for you to you, but it's not necessarily it's common sense. Yeah, bring up this okay. Pete. So my understanding then is that this resolution, um, the MSBA, is in favor of all schools adopting a proficiency-based diploma. It sounds like it, yes. And I think some of this is just about consistency statewide. Right. I mean, there just has been such a lack of it with changes at the Department of Education level um, that schools don't know what the heck to do anymore. Yeah, that's so, issues, right? I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I think I'm just seeing this as trying to establish consistency. I mean, it's not mentioning grading. It's not mentioning the concerns that you've brought up, but it's a step towards consistency. Towards I also think that when the delegate assembly meets and has a huge discussion about this, that that's people from all over the state saying, but we don't believe in it, or we do. So it'll, it'll be a living document. I mean, it'll change. And they might make different changes. So what's your pleasure? <laughs> we ready? All those in favor of this resolution? All those opposed? It's okay, so that's four opposed. 
Okay. Section. So that failed, right? That failed. Uh, section five. A motion to. Oh, I'm sorry. Would somebody make a motion? I move to support the proposed MSBA resolution, special education reform. Speaking of special education. Would somebody please second, second. it? Thank you. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. Any public comment? Any board, oh, board discussion? Let me read it. The Maine School Board Association believes that the special education system created by Congress more than 40 years ago needs to be reviewed and amended on the federal and state level to assure all student needs are being met. A task force created as a result of MSB resolution in, of an MSB resolution in 2016 has made reasonable proposals for change at the state level. Legislation should be introduced in the first session of the 129th legislature to implement those changes. This resolution also directs the MSBA officers to urge Maine's congressional delegation to support reforms recommended by the National School Boards Association when the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, is brought up for reauthorization and fully fund the promised federal share of costs. Any discussion? Okay, so these are the recommendations, right? Because I was curious what the changes were, because they never really said what the changes were, <laughs> just that they were going to update it. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> I guess that's, I guess that's what I'm, I don't know if it's good. <laughs> It, uh, it says what? Remove barriers between special education and general education and create an integrated inclusive system. I don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I could, I you kind of do, but. <laughs> we already do? I see. I think, I thought we did more. I thought that's come a long way over the years my, myself, but there can be, it can go also too far the other way, in, in my personal opinion and my personal experience. Although they do have that part, they do have. Um, mitigate shortage of special education teachers by promoting a dual certification program at the university level. I, how is that going to help? I'm sorry. I know. <laughs> then we'll lose some teachers and put, we'll move them over here. Oh, I don't. I don't know. I'm. I think if you streamlined some of the paperwork, you could keep some of your special. I'm kidding, I know. Tell them next year if they want to do this, come up and pitch it personally. Yeah. <laughs> so we can talk to them. <laughs> I think one of the problems they're trying to address is at the secondary level with um, special education teachers need to be fully certified in the content area and fully certified as a special education teacher, um, that the requirements to do both are making it prohibitive and you're starting to lose um, a pool of individuals at the secondary mm -hmm. level for special education. So I think that's part of what the, the resolution um, is, is trying to explain for you. And they're also recognizing the costs, because uh, part of the rationale is to control the escalating costs, which we all know when we mm -hmm. look at our little budget graph, mm -hmm. how much of our budget money goes Especially. towards special education. Mm -hmm. right. So anything that we can do to control those costs while still serving the needs of the students would be. But I definitely recommend. But I'd love to know what they mean by a push a education friendly system. <laughs> well, <laughs> can help schools bill for Medicaid, Maine care reimbursement. You can ask. I'm going to have to. I guess you will. So once I figure out how we're voting. Okay. <laughs> well, we. It's been moved and seconded. We've had discussion. All those in favor? All those opposed? No abstentions. Okay. Um, could I have a motion for motion six, please? I move to support the proposed MSBA resolution. Oh, no. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Starting teacher pay. Okay. Starting teacher pay and longer school year. It's been moved Second. and seconded. Um, any discussion from the public? Nicole from Wyndham, all the same credentials you heard before. Um, I have, in, over the weekend, um, not only consulted with 
colleagues at the state level, but also within our district. In fact, our executive committee met today um, for the association and just uh, in conversations with other staff members. Some of the concerns that we have, not that we don't think time with our students is valuable, but we're concerned about how this would be funded because, again, as with the other issue, there are hidden costs of energy, both heating and cooling. We're already closing school the day before a vacation as, a, as an energy cost saving measure, and that's only one day. This would be an additional 10 days um, if you take the um, staff PD into account. Speaking of staff PD, we'd, teachers would want assurances that that time would be used in a valuable way, that they would have input into how it was used. Um, would we have input into that? Would there be consistency across the district? Transportation costs on the student days, um, per diem costs for certain employees, salary impact. Um, I'd love to say I'd volunteer to work 10 days for free, but that's probably not going to happen. Um, and I'm sure I would get feedback from those I represent <laughs> about that. Um, I just heard Sandy say, hopefully the state will provide funding for a different um, resolution. We've never met the 55% that was put into law years ago. Um, I don't know where those resources would then come from. What would be the deficits to our students if that happened? Would it come from supplies? Would it come from some of the other things that we're able to offer them? Calendar alignment, I don't know what that would look like. It seems like we struggle now to come up with a calendar that's going to get us out of there before the end of June, even just because of storm days. And um, Sandy had expressed a concern to me at one point about a loss of staff due to child care issues. That would be 10 extra staff days. Um, we don't provide that service for our staff in the district currently. Um, it's an additional two work weeks for your staff members, so there's myriad costs around that. Um, there are students at the high school level who rely on being able to start a summer job, um, staff who take summer courses, and I guess my bottom line is, will this provide the benefit that the MSBA believes it will? Mm. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't read it. <laughs> 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 so, in a nutshell, it's a longer school year, but it's also about um, advocating for a starting teacher salary of $40,000. Um, so, the longer school year would add 10, would add five student days, so to go to 180 days, and five more um, days for. Um, professional development for staff. So 10 total for that, I think. <coughs> so any discussion? Yes, Pete. <laughs> First of all, I think it's a shame that they put these two issues into mm -hmm. one resolution. Mm -hmm. no, the same thing. thing. Mm -hmm. Who's on purpose, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, because they're, <laughs> they're two, they we want one. I don't know, completely so yeah. separate so, um, issues. So that's my first thing. but. Yeah, a longer school year, I don't know, until we can, when I think about like the end of the school year as it is right yeah. now, mm -hmm. and what gets accomplished, I mean, I think you could, if you really mm -hmm. want more instruction going on, there's ways that you can find it within the existing calendar. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's my take on that. And summer remains pretty precious, so mm -hmm. to lengthen right. the school year and everything that Becca has mentioned, yeah. I was thinking of or almost all of the things she brought up some new stuff to so I'm not in favor of this one whatsoever. Marge? Well <clears throat> I think until until Bill finds a, a big pocket of money somewhere to put air conditioning right. in the schools I don't think this is very feasible considering didn't we uh, close the school because right. it was because too hot one day right. <laughs> and uh, climate change is here regardless of what some people say so mm -hmm. the summers will be hotter right. so I, I Mm -hmm. I have a problem having teachers and students in, in school longer for that, and it is, and this is all, it's all money mm -hmm. from the taxpayers. Sure. Because sure. we know the state, God bless them. I don't know, some people have very good intentions, but they don't always follow through with the, the money to support what they can you mandate. Ask, I wonder if you can ask if this is separate. 
if this is separated? I can ask that. Because, I mean, for me, and Oh, why didn't they separate it? Right, exactly. Yep. Why don't you query that? I shall. Okay. Can we just take a second, because we're going to get close to the end of these here, and people are going to run out to just say how awesome it is to have people here. I know, and Talking it? to yes. us and giving us their input. That's really awesome. So thank you guys so much for coming out. I think sometimes we sit here and talk. Whoops, there goes my eraser. <laughs> did you talk? talk? To me? I sure did. <laughs> um, we just talked to an empty room. So this is fantastic. So thank you guys for coming in and letting us know. My only, my only comment about the longer school year and instruction, and correct me if I'm wrong, but every year when we look at our joint school calendar, we have fewer professional days than almost everybody that we join with for that calendar. Thank you, Phil. And we have fewer, do we have fewer student days? Uh, I can't there's, remember. We had there's a couple of schools that have like two more Two more days. days. But the thing that really um, always strikes me with the calendar, and I brought it up every single year, is professional development and how we simply do not have enough time for professional mm -hmm. development. And so for that reason alone, I'm going to vote for it. Okay. I'm, I am supportive of the higher teacher start pay. Well, that too. And I am not supportive of the... <laughs> longer school yeah. year. I am supportive of more <coughs> in-service days. I, so it's a six of one, half a dozen of the other for me. I, so. I think I would like to know the other states that have um, 180 days. The majority of them have 180 and days, yeah. performance-wise, right. where they are at, um, because we do, I, I mean, Maine does lag behind. Right quite a bit, and I, I want my summer just as much, but sure. I want our economy to be growing and our workforce development to be growing and prosperous, so mm -hmm. I will be supporting. Okay. All right, anybody else want to opine? Okay. Then all those in favor? All those opposed? So, could I have a motion on the next one, school attendance? So don't all leap. Come on, guys. Yes. Wait a minute. <laughs> I make a motion to support the proposed MSBA okay, resolution please. school attendance okay. at age five. Okay. Second. It has been moved and seconded. Eric. Oh, you second. Eric. Thank you. Okay, and um, any public comment about this? Oh, sorry, let me read it first. <laughs> the Maine School Boards Association understands how critical early education is to the success of students and believes Maine's current compulsory attendance at age seven is too high and out of step with the rest of the country. MSBA supports recommended age, rec a recommended age of five which is the typical age of kindergartners in the state and compulsory attendant at age six and will advocate for a law change in the first session of the next legislature. Any public comments? They want to know if we want to start kids at seven. I mean, no, at, five. That, uh, at five I and... Okay. I you my name is Hannah Bernier. I'm a Wyndham resident. I have two students in the school system. I currently teach first grade at Wyndham Primary, but for several years taught kindergarten. Um, <clears throat> as it is right now, parents can decide what is best for their child when it comes to whether they're ready academically or the social emotional aspect. The demands of a kindergartner is very high, um, and I'm not saying that that's necessarily good or bad, but some students at age five the social emotional aspect of that to enter kindergarten at the age of five could be detrimental in my opinion um, for their future success in school. As students enter school if we make that mandatory and they enter when they're not ready or their parents feel that they're not ready and able to support them in a way that shows that they're ready um, there's going to be tension and so for a child to start when the family and the child doesn't feel ready 
seems uh, a little disheartening that that would be forced upon the family. Um, my biggest concern being that as of right now, there is a huge gap. Parents are able to wait, um, and so we do have some students entering at five and so, uh, four and some students entering at six. However, right now it still gives the opportunity for families to decide which is best for students and giving them an extra, extra year might not only help them academically, but also the social and emotional aspect of it. Thank you. Board discussion? This is a quick question. You probably even know this one. Uh, when you they probably even know this one. Well, you were teaching this one. <laughs> Primary school. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, what's the cutoff date? October 15th. See, it's different, it's different everywhere, believe yeah, it or not. I mean, yeah. so you have to be. You have to be five by October 15th to start kindergarten. And if I'm reading this right, it actually, right now, the state's mandatory age is seven. And it's proposing dropping the mandatory age to six mm -hmm. with optional at five, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we already do that. So, did you? Compulsory would drop one here. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't, my feeling is that this is a, a problem I mean, the solution in search of a problem. Does that make sense? I don't think that this is a huge problem. I, I, I maybe I'm wrong. Do you, other people have different in, different views, Mr. Yeah. Crockett, <laughs> perhaps. <coughs> do it, so I she might say something different. Um, I think what we struggle with with some of our kindergartners is that. They're signed up to be in school all the time, but they're not really required to be because of the age of seven. So that's a little twist on that. Like once, I agree with what Hannah said, some kids aren't ready at five, but if they're gonna come in at six, they're gonna come into kindergarten, I would hope. And once they register, they need to follow the same attendance rules as everybody else. And so Kindergarten is not what it used to be, half a day of kind of getting right. to know each other mm -hmm. and learning a few letters. We mm -hmm. have a pace in kindergarten. And so if you're not there a lot, <laughs> right. it puts them behind for years. So I don't know if that could be a caveat. And I, I think that point is echoed in the, our concern is the children we are not seeing in right. the rationale. And there, there are parents that can make that decision whether they should be there or not, but there are also a lot of families that cannot make that decision or, or may not even care to make that decision. So I, I think, again, it's, it's the kids that we're not seeing. It's not mm -hmm. the parents that are, are taking the time to assess if their child's ready or not. Okay, so what is the, what is the teeth then that we would put in this? Because whether we say that they have to be there at age seven or age six or age four, parents' choice is they can choose not to have their child come to school. But I think what he was saying is, if you're gonna if you're gonna come in, to come in full, full fledged, not pick it up, you know, two days this week, three days that week. You're in, you're in. You right. Follow the rule. I un I understand that, but you know, I I had experience with kids at the second grade level who would just not show up at school, and it's nothing. And they were seven, so. Mm. Oh, I'm gonna add yeah. to that. Okay. <laughs> The reason they were not showing up in second grade is because the pattern of behavior started in kindergarten. Okay, there we And go. so we cannot do anything, and I literally will put kids' birth dates in my calendar so when I know I can start doing a little bit more um, and enforcing the attendance piece. But now you have about a year to a year and a half of students being in school, and there's a pattern that's developed mm -hmm. and then along with that you have students who now are not in school and when they do come to school we have anxiety because they've missed projects the classroom seats have changed um, and so they come in and it's a new day every time and so then now we're dealing with the mental health piece of children so if we can I believe that some kids are not ready at five years old um, some come in at four and they're not ready and I think that should be a choice for parents to make um, but if they step into school and they've made that commitment we need to say this is our attendance policy that we're gonna follow through from K to 12 thank you you're welcome I just, I just say I think I 
misunderstood things. Um, I do think that when a family decides that they enter kindergarten, that there needs to be consistency in their education. I do agree that when it starts in kindergarten that they're not coming, or I would hear the reasons of, well, it's just kindergarten. Right. It's no longer just kindergarten. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe I misunderstood a little bit when I was talking. Um, I do believe that there needs to be choice of when their child enters. However, when they do enter, I do support that there needs to be an understanding that when you come, there's a need to be there. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. Clear as mud. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no matter what, there's going to be a line drawn, no matter what, right. of when a student is required to be at school and when they're not. Mm -hmm. Currently, it's seven, um, and so this is just saying that it's changing to six. They recommend five, but hey. If you want to keep your kid for another year at home until they're ready, mm -hmm. six is where we're setting the, the line right now. And to me, that seems reasonable, mm -hmm. especially if you're leaving at seven and you have some students coming in at four. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's big a pretty big yeah, gap big for gap. kids to be in the same class. Right. Right. So, I mean... I mean, and there's always going to be exceptions, and maybe there's going to be a waiver system or whatever, mm -hmm. where if there's extenuating circumstances and you don't want your child to start till seven, you can do that. But I'd say, as a general rule, I think six is reasonable. I I agree too, and I know I know very few parents who want to keep their kids home till they're seven years old. <laughs> um, if they could send them at four, they would. Um, but uh, I would definitely uh, go along with this dropping it down, a seven-year-old in kindergarten is pretty okay. neat, I think. How come it is we want to keep it home when they're four, but we want to hit the road when they're 14? I don't know. <laughs> Have you met yeah, a 14-year-old? You know oh, yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah has, you know, that's why he said it. <laughs> so, any more discussion? No. Okay. Hearing none. All those in favor? All those opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Motion for all right. Could I have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed?